2023 wasn't a good year for the Carolina Panthers, but I'm trying to make 2024 a better one for myself. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including keto options, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Skip that overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door, and they're ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Head to factormeals.com slash C350 and use the promo code C350 to get 50% off. That's code C350 at factormeals.com slash C350 to get 50% off. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. You could turn $10 into $250. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash fan and use code fan. That's code fan at prizepicks.com slash fan. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. In a world where Carolina Panthers fans have an insatiable thirst for Panthers news and opinions, only one podcast roars ferociously. It's the C3 Panthers podcast. Perfect, perfect, perfect. What's up, Panther fans? Tony Dunn, a.k.a. The Professor. It's the C3 Panthers podcast brought to you by CarolinaCatChronicles.com. Tonight's a special Monday free agency edition as we continue to expand the C3 channel. We try to bring you uh, content and diversify it in this offseason going forward. On top of that, our new goal is to stream every night. Probably not. Actually, that's not our goal in life. But (laughs) continuing to bring those fresh perspectives. And I messaged Cody. I said, I got to I want to talk about free agents. And so I messaged my co-host, my wheel man. I said, It's time to talk about who's going to be a free agent for the Carolina Panthers going into 2022. So that will be the focus of our show tonight. Who's the free agents? What who are the free free agents pending? Who should we keep? Who should we kick? And how much money do we have uh, to make these decisions? Cody Lashney, uh, thanks for joining me on short notice. Yeah, Tony, we just got done doing a show with Chris Jenkins of Charlotte Vibe doing a little miniature roundtable. So uh, we figured we'd come on here and uh, hang out with you guys, man. I got Monday night uh, playoff football on one screen. I got my C3 Panthers podcast doing it here with Tony on one screen. I'm having a good night, man. Ready to go. We got some people in the chat room already. Uh, The Real Zero Chill, Seth Robinson in the building, Tim Estes. Uh, Yeah, Tony Dunn, it's a Monday edition. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. Let's talk free agents. All right, uh, we're going to start on the offensive side of the ball. The Carolina Panthers, I believe it is 21 free agents that we're facing. And I know uh, as I have uh, covered the Carolina Panthers on this podcast for the last 10 years, every year the GM complains about how many people are going leaving and com- coming and going, right? And that is that is the NFL. That's the perpetual cycle of the NFL. We're going to start on the offensive side of the ball and in this, I ultimately have special teams factored in as well because I, I tend, I won't say that all special teams yeah. is offensive, but the punt returners are on the offensive side. I mean, Amir Abdullah, running back, Ian Thomas, uh, tight end, Trent Scott, bum. Oh, I mean guard, Matt Paradis, uh, John bum. Miller, Big yeah, bum. John Miller, the biggest bum probably. Cam Newton, legend. The GOAT. The GOAT. And then you get to the bottom, which is an interesting group. Actually, we'll, uh, well, I'll, I'll say we'll do Brandon Zilstra, 
um, as these are offensive. And then we'll go to special teams since I've got it on the screen. As we look at this list, Cody, um, what we have to me that's standing out is Cam Newton, a uh, six game rental uh, that really as, as the, as the uh, conversation continued to emerge about him wanting to find success and be on a successful team, and really just a kind of a strange relationship that unfolded. Uh, it, it, maybe not a relationship, but almost a playing relationship with the Panthers in the six game he games he was with. Right now is that, I mean, I just don't see Cam Newton wanting to come back to the Carolina Panthers. You look at Matt Paradis as a guy who is uh, coming off a major injury and a vet, a big-time vet, you know what I mean? He, was, he got a, a, a sizable paycheck for the Carolina Panthers when we signed him three or four years ago. And and then the rookie, Ian, or not the rookie, he's in the last year of his rookie deal, Ian Thomas, yep. the man who Matt Rule said is the brand working hard out there, but basically uh, has never broken into a successful campaign. And that's really about it for these names. I mean, Miradula might be the only guy on the list that uh, anybody wants to keep. Well, no, I mean, actually, no, I disagree with you. I think there's one name on that list that probably uh, Panther fans want kept the most, and that's Zane Gonzalez, baby. And Zane oh, no, memory. that's special teams. You're jumping ahead. You're special. You're jumping ahead. But Let's stick no, with your straight. He's our best offensive weapon and by far scores our most points. It's almost second nature for me to consider him uh, offense when he is the majority of our offense. But um, so listen, man, I think you all know how I feel about Cam Newton. Um, what I want to happen is more than likely not what's going to happen. Um, I think Cam Newton would be a perfect bridge to whatever we have going on. There's so much in flux and there's so much that we don't know. I would love for Cam Newton to be able to come back. Sadly, I don't think our organization has much, much interest in doing that. So um, that's a tough one, man. I hate that yet again we're talking about a scenario like this for Cam Newton to exit his team um, under these circumstances. But there's not a lot to like uh, on this list here, Tony. You and I have been talking about uh, for, what, two years now, how disappointed we've been in Ian Thomas and the fact that he hasn't shown himself to be a, you know, a, a true – you know, dependable tight end like we've wanted him to be. Now, granted, maybe the coaches never gave him uh, quite the opportunity, but he certainly hasn't warranted another paycheck, in my opinion. Um, Amir Abdullah is someone that I really enjoyed watching play this year. In the absence of Christian McCaffrey, I feel like he was a much better pass-catching running back out of the backfield than, obviously, Truba Hubbard was. Um, and I think he does have some good burst in uh in the way he runs. And then look, man, every single offensive lineman that you have listed right here, Tony, I don't want to ever see any of these jokers ever again, dude. That goes for Trent Scott, John Miller, and Matt Paradis. And I want to take a minute to uh, hone in on Matt Paradis. What a disappointment this guy has been. Ever since we brought him in, what, three years ago? When we signed him, he was Pro Football Focus's number one rated, uh, at the time, free agent center. And I have felt so underwhelmed by Matt Paradis almost every year. He has never lived up to that contract, never lived up to the level of play that apparently he had um, achieved with the Denver Broncos. I, I just, I, I don't trust either of those three guys, man. So... Sadly, outside of uh, Cam Newton and maybe bringing Amir Abdullah back on a, a nice small contract, yeah, those are the only two that I'm looking at that I would even like to have back next year. Um, Let me see. What did we sign him to? It looked like, hmm, I'm trying to feel like Matt Paradis. I guess he got, he's made $31 million career earnings. He played with the Broncos, undrafted, practice squad, uh, unrestricted free agent. Maybe he didn't make as much as I expected him. Ooh. I mean, he made a good, a, a little bit, well, a little bit of change with the Carolina Panthers. All right, disappointment, yes. Uh, best year that he had with the Carolina Panthers was last year. Suffered injury this past year. 
And in his first season with the Carolina Panthers, well, he was with us in 2019, 2020, 2021. So only three seasons, right, uh, with the Carolina Panthers. What I've learned about Matt Paradis is, or Paradis has kind of revealed to me or reinforced to me is what we learned with Matt Khalil. And that is um, don't sign guys that are coming off an injury. You know, and Matt Paradis was a guy who, who was playing very well before he had, I think it was a hip injury or something like that. Very similar, I think, or some sort of leg injury, something similar to Matt Khalil, you know, and, and that is that their what they were doing on the field before they got injured dictated kind of their value. And you're accepting that they're going to come back and be ready from day one. Uh, when it comes to guys coming off of significant injuries, I'm just to the point now where I think, yeah, they're going to play that first year, but they're not going to be to form in that first year. Paradis looked in better form last year and then suffers a significant injury this year. So, yeah, is that like, I mean, right now is there's is no point unless he's uh, really rehabbing well and willing to come back on a very, very friendly deal just because right now it's Pat Eflon who is your starting center. You don't have a lot of draft capital. Tecklenburg, not working well, also got injured at the end. I think Amir Abdul is an interesting name here because uh, of the special teams value that he offers. And as we move on uh, in a moment to the special teams, you'll see there is a lot. there are a lot of questions in that, uh, that unit right there to go forward. Trent Scott, John Miller, they can get lost, particularly John Miller, not interested in ever seeing him in a Panthers jersey again. Um, and I think the fact that they were trading back and forth, like a deflecting blame towards the end, just got irritating and fatiguing for me. Um, and I'm sure taking that whooping for them was fatiguing, particularly for guys like Cam Newton <laughs> and Sam Darnold. Cam Newton, I think this is, I don't want uh, Cam Newton to finish his career on a team that is in shambles, and that truly feels like what the Carolina Panthers are. But when you look at this collectively as a group, the way I like to, or I'm trying to think of this, is whether or not these guys are good or not, Paradis, Miller, Scott, and the way that Matt Rule talks with the front seven, the offensive front, like the, uh, like, like, he looks at his tight ends as part of the offensive line, right? Because they do both, you know, a receiving role and a blocking role is a, there's a lot of work for the Carolina Panthers to be done on a group that was already bad, but maybe there will be addition by subtraction. And the fact is whoever you go out and recruit uh, for these positions, um, hopefully will be better. And I think part of the offense off season plan is going to be allocate as many uh, resources as you can to this offensive line. I mean, because at this point you have to not only were they bad, but now it's about putting bodies in jerseys, you know, yeah. is that you got to be able to fill out the line and by losing a tight end right now is who are, I mean, we, we have, we have Tommy Trimble, but you can't even name the other tight end. Ricci, who is listed as a fullback, that's it. Like, I mean, so you're going to have to get somebody, no matter what. These offensive linemen, even if their rotational players are going to be have to be replaced, maybe this is forcing our hand in a good way. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think so, man. Uh, I, I mean, how, how embarrassing is it, though, that Trent Scott and John Miller played so many snaps for the Panthers this year? And yet we're like, dude, leave and never come back. Leave and never, ever, ever come back, man. And, you know, it makes you worry a little bit about our depth. Um, and now, you know, we've been talking about Deontay Brown and Brady Christensen. Well, you better hope that those guys are indeed the guys. Because if you're going to trot them out there next year and they're not ready and they didn't get enough time to be professional starters – um, and actually, uh, you know, adjust to those positions, then the depth is not going to be very good on the offensive line again this year. Well, even if they do, how about this? Uh, if you trot them out there and and they are starters, say that they are great, there's still two positions 
each and every week that have you have to find starters for. Yeah. What those positions are, we can argue and debate about whether it's a tackle or guard and this and that. But right now, Moten is the only starter on the line. We haven't seen anybody else play a starting role except for Pat F line, which now he's probably going to have to be at this point. And so you're going to need to add bodies regardless of what you think of Brady Christensen. You're going to have to find starters regardless of what you think Deontay Brown and Brady Christensen can be. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be prepared for everything on the offensive line. And it goes back to us not having a ton of resources to be able to do it with Tony. So I don't know. It'll be very interesting to see what they're able to do to try and fix this offensive line. Sadly, not not our general manager or our head coach has given us a lot of confidence uh, that they could fix this offensive line. So let's turn our attention to the special teams. And like we mentioned with Amir Abdullah, who I f- feel like gives us both, like you said, a pass catching option, but also sort of punt return, kickoff return type of player, special teams players played in the league for eight years. But even though we didn't really utilize him a ton like that, um, but if we look towards the bottom of the screen right here, J.J. Jansen, uh, our long, the longest tenured Panther, Lachlan Edwards, who was our punter uh, throughout maybe half of the season, Zane Gonzalez, the field goal kicker, and Alex Erickson, even though he's listed as a wide receiver, did catch one important pass, I think, in the regular season, but he played the punt returner for this team. The entire special teams unit is going to have to be turned over, Cody. That's an interesting point right there. Is maybe not turned over, but here is that if you're Zane Gonzalez, you got a little negotiating power here. Yeah, man, and especially when you look earlier this year, Tony, how much problems we had filling that position, man. Uh, I mean, I remember the names of Ryan Santoso, you know, Joey Sly. I mean, th- that was – that was rough, man. Uh, and the fact that we, uh, after Zan Gonzalez got injured this year, dude, the shit show that ensued was epic. We had PJ Walker trying to kick field goals. Uh, it was terrible, man. We had no backup plan in case Zane went down. And you can make the case that that really did hurt us in that Buffalo game. Terrible wind. You couldn't really throw the ball. You had to be able to kick field goals. And they pretty much always had to go for two points, even if they did get in the end zone. You are right. I think Zane does have a little bit of leverage. Um, and the Panthers would be pretty dumb to not pay him pretty much, you know, I don't want to say whatever he wants, but they got to pay him a decent contract because he was the only consistent Panther kicker that we've had since, you know, prime Graham Gano, which I know you, that's not a name that you want to hear or remember very fondly, but It's the sad truth. Did not love, was not a Graham Gano lover or fan, but at the same time, you know what I'm not a fan of is not having a a prospect or answer at field goal kicker, a guy that you feel confident in. I do think that Zane Gonzalez earned uh, his position on the team going forward. Sadly, because he's a free agent, we're going to have to pay him that position. But I've seen too many times this team trying to figure out who the kicker is in training camp. And I don't want us to have that like, oh, we're trying to figure it out because we weren't willing to pay Zane Gonzalez. Now, I don't want us to shoot ourselves in the foot, pun intended, about overpaying him. Right. So I don't think that he does like we can't just pay him regardless of, you know, because we feel obligated. But he has got to be the priority out of all the names on this whole screen right here. He's got to be the number one. Another interesting name to me is Alex Alex Erickson, the fair catch fairy. He's the fair catch fairy, bro. I I don't know if I saw this guy return a punt all year, it felt like. And if he did, it went for like one yard. And look, I know that's one of the toughest jobs in the NFL. These guys are coming after your head. He did not fumble and stumble, and he didn't muff any punts. But we weren't getting a lot of positive uh, yards, so it's not like he is a priority. Uh, poor Brandon Zilstra is probably going to be a guy that, you know, that might be a guy you actually bring back 
is a guy that feels comfortable. He has a, a rapport with the coaching staff, um, has really actually played above his station a lot of times, right? It's just never being able to crack the lineup and probably will not crack the lineup, but his familiarity with the coaching staff might bring him back on a, like a league minimum or a short term deal. Uh, but man, punter kicker. I mean, like this is a, there is a lot of turnover here on this side of the ball. This is not going to be an easy look. I have said that one of the hard things for me this past year was with the number changes and the turnover of new players in addition to this team, it's like one of the few times that like in, in the last 10 years where you say a number, and it takes me a moment to think of who that guy is sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Next year, there's going to be a lot of new dudes in new numbers. Yeah, there certainly is, man. Um, and listen, man, shout out to Brandon Zilstra. He made some big plays for us this year. I mean, early on before Sam Donald and the rest of the team completely collapsed, uh, he made some good plays. He had some good touchdowns. Um, I believe he caught some big passes from Cam Newton and Sam Donald. So, yeah, that guy, I mean, he, he works hard when his name has been called upon. He's been able to make plays for us. So it's hard not to want to reward that. It's also not – he's not going to be expensive either. He does have familiarity here. So I can see him cracking the lineup a little easier here uh, than anywhere else potentially. Um, but then again, I don't know, man. When you think about Terrace Marshall Jr. and um, Shai Smith, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Brandon's on special teams, but, you know, they, they, they want to get him into the game at some point, even if it's that slot receiver. And I just don't know if that's going to happen when you have Terrace Marshall and Shai Smith waiting there. Um, yeah, man. How about, shout out to Sarah Taylor, one of our uh, big fans, Sarah Taylor. She loves her some Brandon Zilstra. So he's a fan favorite, Tony. Let's bring him back. Let's see what he can do. Who on this screen uh, right now on the offensive side and special teams is on this team next year? I feel like we haven't mentioned J.J. Jansen enough yet. The most tenured Panther player that there is, right? Uh, are, we, are we really going to sign him and spend money on him after we drafted a lot, Fletcher? Yeah, whatever see, that I do? don't, I don't think so. I don't think so, man. Um, dude, again, outside of Cam Newton, this entire list is, uh, <laughs> it is what it is. You know what I mean? Um, I put my I, money on Zane Gonzalez, and sure, I think Zane, Zane Gonzalez and Amir Abdullah, two names on this uh, right here that make this that could be on this roster going forward. Yeah, I think so too. And neither of them are very are going to be super expensive. Maybe Zane because of the position that he is. Like we mentioned, he, the Panthers don't have a ton of options outside of Zane. So, yeah, I can see that. Those are two good picks. Let's switch over to the defensive side of the ball. There's a lot of faces up here. Uh, some are important. Some are um, were, were big-time contributors this year. We go down the list. Justin Burris. Jermaine Carter Jr., Sean Chandler, Stephon Gilmore, Hassan Reddick, Dante Jackson, Daquan Jones, Frankie Louvu, Rashawn Melvin, Marquise Haynes, and there was one more that got covered up right there, Julian oh, Stanford, man. who I don't know. All right, um, as we look at this list on the defensive side of the ball, for me, what's interesting about this is that the names that we're replacing on the defensive side of the ball – were significant contributors to this team. Unlike the offensive side of the ball where these guys, we want them to leave and see you later, say sayonara, part of the Panthers, the only part of success that the Panthers had this year was on the defensive side of the ball, right? If you're going to say that there was one positive, you're going to hear Matt Rule say the number two defense. And there's some names on this list that were important contributors to that for me, uh, Dante Jackson, well, let's just say, number one, Hassan Reddick, the most productive, or at least on the stat sheet, the most productive player, at least the sexy stat with sacks, Hassan Reddick. But I think Daquan Jones probably was what, maybe just as much as an important contributor in some ways. It might not show up on the stat sheet, but this guy was, he was making plays and was an important part of that defensive front. Dante Jackson in the early section and Jermaine Carter Jr. got a ton of snaps. So, I mean, there's some names here that were important to this team 
And there's some exciting names or some younger name or one younger name I'm interested in talking about. Cody, as you look at this defensive side of the ball, one, two, three, six. Uh, another, this is 11. 11 people on the defense. 11 defensive players. One, two, three, four, five starters. <clears throat> Maybe six yeah. if you say Stefan Gilmore, which I don't I wouldn't classify necessarily as a starter as a because he's kind of like a mercenary. But Justin Burris Stephon, starter, yeah. Jermaine Carter Jr. starter, Hassan Reddick starter, Dante Jackson starter, Daquan Jones starter. That's a that's a lot of bodies yeah, and important no, bodies to fill. Yeah, this is a tough one, Tony. And I was about to say take that entire row and cut them out. But then you realize Jermaine Carter Jr. is literally our only answer at middle linebacker. Like, that's our guy, man. And I've been saying uh, since before the start of the last season that our linebacker depth is very thin and our safety depth is very thin. So it's like guys like Justin Burris and Jermaine Carter and Sean Chandler, it's like for as no name as they are, dude, we have to have players to play the positions. Or else that's another group of players that you're going to have to make sure that you acquire either via free agency or the draft. Um, that's a tough position to be in, Tony, because especially that top row, I don't love any of those dudes. I mean, I really don't, especially Justin Burris. Like I, I feel like he always gets picked on every time I'm watching him. So, I mean, you know, that, that's a tough situation to be in. But then you look at that second row, and that's where it gets super problematic because, you know, as you mentioned, these are the guys that really made a difference on our team this year um, in certain scenarios. Dante Jackson is the most controversial one because we've been wondering what kind of player Dante is for a long time. Is he really a shutdown corner? Should we move him to nickel? Should we move him back to free safety even, which a lot of fans wanted to do? Frankly, I would love to move him around the field anymore. I just don't know how much Dante Jackson is willing to do that. Plus, when you factor in trading for C.J. Henderson and trading for Stephon Gilmore, who, from from the looks of it, Stephon Gilmore does want to stay here in Charlotte. So I've said this during the season, that kind of makes Dante Jackson the odd man out in that scenario. Um, Hassan Reddick, Tony, if I'm having to bet, uh, and we spoke about this a little bit on Chris Jenkins' show. If we had to place a bet for who we're going to use our uh, franchise tag on, I think it's probably going to be Hassan Reddick. Now, granted, if you do put the tag on Hassan, that is a pretty penny for one year that you're going to be paying for Hassan Reddick. So, again, that's a tough one in and of itself. But uh, that was the majority of our pass rushing stats this year was, um, you know, basically Hassan coming off the edge. Absolutely got snubbed for a Pro Bowl. He absolutely should have went to a Pro Bowl, but didn't uh, didn't get enough votes from uh, his peers. Uh, and then that, that final row, Tony, that final row, we would be remiss if we didn't take a minute to talk about Frankie Louvu. Yeah, I mean, I, one. Yeah. yeah, I feel like from the start of the year, all the way through the middle of the year, this guy has the size, the speed, and the physicality, and the ball senses to be able to play linebacker in the NFL. I like everything about the way he plays. I really hope the Panthers do whatever necessary to bring Frankie Luvu back this year, um, especially knowing how thin we are at linebacker depth. Like I mentioned before, you have to have Frankie Luvu coming next year. Um and, and I think that he's going to be an important part of our defense moving forward. Uh, and then, I mean, really, Tony, that's that's pretty much it. Even someone like Daquan Jones, I think you're hoping that a player like Davion Nixon, uh, who you have as a rookie, would be able to kind of fill into that role a little bit. Um, again, you know you have Derek Brown. Uh, it's and nice they- having a vet there, though. True, true, true. Very true. Very true. I think in an ideal world, this middle row is like what you would want to keep all the way across the board, right? I mean, if you could sign Gilmore, Reddick, and Jackson, you know, like all of a sudden, like your defense could stay where it was. 
without having a big step back, but that's not uh, going to happen. I uh, had not thought about Hassan Reddick on the franchise tag until they mentioned it tonight. Some of the guys on the Chris Jenkins show, but I, to be honest, uh, right now, I don't know if we, I think we're gonna have to allocate so much money to the offensive side of the ball, particularly on the offensive line that I don't know if, if you're going to pay him uh, what a, cause he would be classified as a linebacker. And I don't know when they, when they find, if they, uh, when they calculate the franchise tag, if they distinguish between like inside outside linebacker type stuff. Yeah. Middle. But I mean, the top five linebacker, and I think they average it in the top five or something like that. Top four right now, the top four linebackers get paid. The The highest paid one is Darius Leonard at $19.7 million. And then the fifth highest is down at 14 and a half. So you're talking about, uh, Hassan Reddick as a potentially a 16, 17 million dollar player on a one year deal who signed a particularly team friendly deal at like seven million, eight million this past year for one year. I after he had ten and a half or whatever the amount of sacks he had in the most productive year or, or at least for us, I I just see it's it's I just feel like it's going to be hard to to pay him and then you hear all the talk about from scott fitter about needing to get bigger on the edges yep now if uh somehow that they are confident that they're going to be able to move brian burns okay and then you can secure hassan reddick at that expense but i don't think you can if uh, we would hear all the talk about scott fitter saying we got to get stronger bigger at the edges and then think that you're going to bring back Reddick and Brian Burns. Then that's just the same thing over again, unless you're going to really change the scheme of the defense to a three, four and go out and find a bigger bodied guy to put beside Derek Brown, because the, it doesn't sound like they're confident that YGM could be that right now. Right. I mean, they just, I just don't feel like they think they have the personnel to do that. They've also mentioned that the middle linebacker, that they got to get more stout and middle right linebacker. Jermaine Carter Jr. has played, uh, I thought last year that he played um, a little bit better, but he was kind of a guy that was, you had lower expectations. Now you're starter each and every week. And I wouldn't say that he played poorly, but he just played okay. And I think in coverage sometimes he showed some liabilities, at least a lot of times they were just popping it over his head and getting a lot of yards over the middle of the field. So I don't see the Carolina Panthers allocating a significant amount of money towards Jermaine Carter Jr. And I see Jermaine Carter Jr. trying to be at a moment in his career, getting as much every dollar he can out of contract. I think Frankie yep. Louvu is a guy that you can sign uh, that has kind of more upside, right? But you're signing him to be a rotational player. So he's not going to command starting money. Um, so right now, if I was going to put, if I think I'm identifying um, players that could return, I like Daquan Jones to have that veteran presence. Like, do you remember who was the guy I love? Who's that big Kyle guy? Love. Yeah. Like kind of playing family. that, that, that type of love, that, that type of role. Yeah. 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 Um, it does sound like they've been interested in Dante Jackson. Right, they have they've spoken highly of him. Uh, I think that Stefan Gilmore, I it would be nice, but I don't think he's going to take some deal. I think if I was him, I'd just go take one year as much money as I can get from somebody. I don't know if I'd be taking a team friendly deal. I like this as I like the Panthers bringing back Luvu, Daquan Jones, making a run at Gilmore or Jackson, maybe both. And uh, I could actually see Justin Burr's back on this team at a discount, you know, just because he's not going to cost a lot. So right there, though, that's still all of a sudden this team is going to be different on defense. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you a question, too. You mentioned YGM. Do you think maybe there's a scenario where we just don't know? You know, you said the coaches aren't very happy with them, but ostensibly they weren't very happy with Deontay Brown and Brady Christensen either. And we think that those guys are probably pretty good. Do you think that uh, that in particular is just a case where uh, he just hasn't 
quite been given the opportunity to maybe sure. yeah yeah i actually i mean i'm not down on his play i think he's actually yep. um performed very well for the opportunities he's he's been given right i just don't know if you're if you're trying to switch to a three four defense right which i mean if you wanted to bring back brian burns and hassan reddick you would really um want to i think recharacterize your defense into a predominantly three four defense not that, you know, I mean, and we, we've had mixed looks. We've had 4-3, we've done 3-4, then we do all these other stuff. And that's helpful to be multiple, right? But at the end of the day, like, you got to stop the run. Like, that's yeah. just something that's important to this team. And running out 3-4 personnel in a 4-3 scheme is not, wasn't getting it done. Uh, so it's not always how you line up. It's how the personnel can also play that. So I think if you really wanted to have Reddick and Burns on the field at the same time, all the time, which you're going to want, right, is that you're going to want those guys to be kind of stand-up defensive ends. Yeah. And you need those three guys. Yeah. The other to be stout. And it would just take a lot of confidence in this staff to say, you know what, we can do that with Derek Brown, YGM, and Morgan Fox. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I think we've all kind of had this notion for a while that the Panthers aren't truly built to adequately play a 4 3 or a 3 4. Like, it, you know, it gets most headlines about our lack of offensive identity. But outside of, you know, us being really aggressive and getting to the quarterback early on in the season, we really don't have that much of a defensive identity either especially when you look at how many games the Panthers' defense lost this year. And, and you've made this point. Like, who did our defense beat? What team that was a damn good football team did our defense actually step up against? And they frankly didn't. I mean, even if you want to say the the Cardinals, they weren't even playing Kyler Murray and like half of their best players. So um, going into this offseason, we really need to focus – on what kind of defense we want to be and make sure that we evaluate players that are going to fit that. I do think YGM can be a big part of our future going forward. And Tony, one of the things that I've said that I believe Panther fans need to keep their eyes out on, if there is a highly talented defensive end sitting there at number six that the Panthers end up falling in love with throughout the process, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they do go defensive end at pit number six. So it's all stuff. to Never keep in will we ever pick an offensive lineman. That is going to be the rule. I think as long as I do this podcast now, we've talked about the things we, the people that are on the list, who do you want to keep? Who do you want to kick? Yep. What are the resources that we have to go after it? I think is the question right now, the Carolina Panthers, this is according to over the cap.com middle of the pack when it comes to cap space it says there's going to be there's 24 million dollars in 2022 but it says 14 million dollars effective cap space i wonder if that's just factoring in for the rookies uh, 181 million dollars in active cap spending now i guess i wonder if they have not continually um if, if we haven't adjusted what the uh the cap is going to be i don't know if those official numbers have been announced like how it's going to jump but we do believe the salary cap is going to go up significantly i think uh, above 200 million uh so here is that for some reason the carolina panthers and this i guess goes back to some of the things that we talked about last season a lot cody in that um why I guess tanking from a team standpoint rather than on the field standpoint can have some benefits is that uh, the Panthers have a lot of a lot of positions to replace a lot of contributors to to replace or at least to try to figure out what to do with uh, and not an absolute ton of money to do it with so how do you allocate this money where do you allocate it and uh 
how different will this team be going forward, at least just from who we jettison? Yeah, I mean, Tony, do you remember early this season, we were like, oh, the Panthers, we're good on money. You know, we were actually one of the teams at the top as far as the amount of free agency dollars that, that we had. Um, yeah, man, the fact of the matter is the Panthers do not get a lot of bang for their buck. They end up signing and sinking money into a lot of players that we end up trading away, or they're not as good as the contract that we paid them. And that's a problem, man. That is, you're talking about three general managers have played their part in doing what we're talking about here, signing players to terrible contracts. Um, I, I mean, it's been a group effort to make the Panthers this bad. Um, and that's part of why just as an organization, we have to get so much better at evaluating talent because we're just not finding the right guys for the right amount of money. Um, and in the draft as well, we're not, you know, if we do draft the guys, we don't play them enough. And that's even if we pick the right players at that position. That's why we all feel like Matt Rule isn't going to be long um, as our head coach. But uh, and then Tony, when you look at free agency as far as what we would be willing to do outside of our football team, you know, if there's a bunch of good offensive linemen available, you're thinking the Panthers are going to want to at least get one of those offensive linemen who maybe had, you know, um, a good analytical grading. Maybe they statted out well. Um, but we have to make sure that we continue to build these trenches. Um, and I don't know how, how we're going to do that with the money situation as it is. The I guess to complicate this even more so is that it doesn't look like there's a lot of area to free up right. a significant amount of money. Um, so if we look at this, um, I pulled up like uh, kind of like who you could cut yeah, to to free up some space. Now you can uh, you know you can tighten the belt a little bit and with some guys like uh, Cam Irvin would get you two million dollars, but at the expense. If you look at the far right two columns, dead money on the left column in pink. Uh, cap savings on the right side. So you really have to look at that right side to see how much money you would actually save to free up and then look at how much you would actually be contributing to the cap. So I know trading Christian McCaffrey um, is, is a hot topic, uh, right? An ability to free up money, but you really, uh, you, you do free up $12 million, but at the expense of $26 million in dead money. So I just have a hard time seeing that, um, taking shape. Shaq Thompson, uh, another person, is that right now you have no starting linebackers other than him on this squad uh, going into next season. You would There's going to be $12.5 million in dead money uh, to the tune of getting five, almost about $5.5 million in cap savings. Robbie Anderson would cost you a ton in debt, so you don't save – like, where do you skimp and crimp and save right here? And uh, there's there are very few people on this list right here where you can clear up some money. And, I mean, it's like you're talking maybe A.J. Bouye is one guy. You could probably say sayonara to him. Yep. Uh, Morgan Fox, maybe, right? Uh, maybe gives you I a like little Morgan, room. though. Mor I think Morgan played well for us this year at times. He was all right. Yeah, but I mean, like, and even Cameron Irvin at this point is that he doesn't even really give you a lot of money, you know, is that um, you are you would be paying him, well, you would save $2 million just to say we don't want nothing to do with you anymore. But there's a lot of questions. So as we turn that over, Cody, let's finish this show because we're going to keep tonight's show short. Um, as we go back, I'm going to say this, as I put the names up one more time, as you see, there's a very limited amount of money, uh, for the Carolina Panthers out of these lists of both the offensive on the offense and the defense, who do you prioritize? Wow. That's a good question, man. Um, so if I'm prioritizing people, here's who I'm prioritizing. Um, I am prioritizing 
Stephon Gilmore because I do want that veteran presence to be amongst our cornerback room. Um, I think Hassan Reddick is somebody that, you know, he just accounted for so much of our sack production this year. You have to say that he's probably um, a guy that you really do have to try and bring back. Uh, and then Frankie Louvu. Frankie Louvu, to me, you know, like I said earlier, that guy to me says Panthers linebacker. He's six foot three, 245 pounds, flies around to the football, has a nose for the football. You know, I even thought that we should have given Frankie Louvu more opportunities to play Mike's linebacker this year. And he did a few times, and I thought that he did well. Um, and then, yeah, man, when we go back on the offense, again, I go back to Cam Newton. I would love to see him um, get another chance behind a better offensive line with a more competent passing attack. But, yeah, we just – we kind of know that isn't going to happen, man. And before we leave, Tony, I'll definitely be excited. And at some point, we're going to do another free agency show, breaking down some of the players that, that Carolina might bring in, potentially. I think that would be a that would be a good idea, too. But um, it'll be interesting to see who we do decide to bring in uh, to the football team and, and how we decide to add through free agency. If Fitterer is a Dave Gettleman guy – where, uh, you know, you use your free agency to set up your draft. I'm hoping that that's still the mindset and the methodology Um, because the Panthers need a lot, man. We really do need a lot on offense and defense in order to be, I think, a legitimate contender going forward. The guys I prioritize on both sides here is, number one, I'll start with Zane Gonzalez. I think it's going to be difficult to replace your entire special teams unit all in one successful swoop in the off season with guys that you're not familiar with. So, I mean, trying to get back a punt, you know, and this Lachlan Edwards dude kind of stunk it up towards at the end. It felt as well. People talked badly about who was the guy. I thought he was actually pretty good as I, but they kept saying that like his net punting guard stunk. Who was the guy that he replaced, uh, went out, um, the guy that last year he made his name by kicking it over the wrong wall at the practice field a couple of times. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he, like, shanked it over the wall. But then he was very good last year, and then I felt like, I feel like he's pretty good at pinning cats back in the 10, you know, is that may so, but his overall punt numbers were not uh, impressive to a lot of people. So I just feel like, hey, man, you got to replace your long snapper, your punter, and your field goal kicker, and all the guys that return the kicks. Let's keep the most important position at field goal kicker. Let's settle that right away. I do think bringing back Amir Abdullah, a veteran presence in the running back room as a guy that offers special teams, uh, could help potentially if uh, Christian McCaffrey is injured. We saw him be really a contributor right away as he came to Carolina midseason. So that's a guy that I'd try to bring back on a very – but, you know, uh, a very friendly deal. The sad part is, is you've got a lot of invested in Christian McCaffrey as well as draft capital invested in, help me out, uh, the guy I don't like that much, who's the run, uh, running back from Chuba Oklahoma, Hubbard. Chuba Hubbard. On this side of the ball, to be honest, I know you're not going to like to hear it, but I like Justin Burris coming back as a guy that's a veteran that's going to be cheap, 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 and so you don't have to redo everything. Uh, Luvu is a guy I think you target because of a guy that's going to be a discount player that has showed some promise. Then you got to start looking at the trifecta of the leftovers of who could you get. Uh, Stefan Gilmore, Dante Jackson, Hassan Reddick. To be, to be honest, if we bring back uh, any one of those three, we're going to be lucky. I mean, because it's like... Uh, Dante is, you know, Dante might be the most, um, the one that you could probably land the easiest just because the last two years he has been hurt. So he doesn't really have a ton to negotiate with. Stefan Gilmore has defensive player of the year under his belt, right? So he could say, you know, I don't want a long deal, but I want one that's size of, you know, I want it to be $14 million for one year. Yeah. And somebody will give it to him, you would think, or at least we, it would be difficult for us to. Son Reddick, I think, is going to cost too much, even with the cap, with the, or I don't know. I'll have to really, we'll start, have to ask some experts about what the franchise tag will do. 
but there's not a lot of room to free up. I mean, if he, if that's $15 million right there next year on a one year deal, and you only have $24 million to work with, that doesn't leave you a lot. Yeah, it really doesn't, man. And that's what I'm saying. We don't have a bunch of resources because we shot our wide this year, you know, trading for Stefan Gilmore. And that's another thing, right? Like Cam Newton Henderson, too, the rollover, yeah. the rollover hurt us. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, is that we should have been jettisoning assets. But uh, instead, at some we're taking point. them on. And then we jettisoned our draft picks too. So that's where this also gets is complicated. 21 free agents hit the market. One draft pick in the top 100. And um, really a lack of ability, it looks like, on the face of it. Unless we're going to get – I have to get with some people that are really good with the cap and some stuff. But if we just switch over and you look at these players, and I'll bring it up one more time just to show you here, is like where do you free up the space? That's the thing. It's one thing to say we don't have a lot of cap money and we got a lot of players, but – you know, there's always like usually some sort of kind of contract that is going to that you could maybe see as something being worth freeing up here. But like Robbie Anderson, I mean, unless you're going to be trying to trade him, not cut him, um, you're going to replace all the linebackers in one fatal swoop. Yeah, and all, you know, it, it's tough, man. Um, I mean, look, is that there's nobody else that helps. Um, like, I mean, you, I mean, you got to keep Taylor. You can't replace the whole offensive line. I mean, you just signed Taylor Moten, DJ Moore. I mean, like all these guys are on cheap deals too. So you're not saving any money. Like you're just talking about cutting 10, $800,000 players to get one guy. Um, that's a tough ass. There's not a lot. So look, it, it, it looks like just from the surface of it, we've got a lot of important positions to replace on defense, a lot of contributors to replace on defense, a lot of important positions to fill on offense and special teams, and not a ton of money to do it. Yeah. It, 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 dude, it's tough, man. I wish we had more options. A lot of people think that we can still trade back and pick up some picks. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what we what we do going forward. Things are looking bleak for the Carolina Panthers, or at least for Panther fans, but we got you covered, guys. It's the C3 Panthers podcast. We'll be live tomorrow night uh, at 9 p.m. doing a season and review, sh- review show. I hope if I can get the time to finish up my clips, we might have to wing it because I have to go – to my aunt's funeral she passed away over the weekend so i gotta go oh, show support that, for my father yeah is that uh you know my dad's sister passed away on thursday or friday of last week so uh it's going to be a little you know it's a different part of my day so i'm going to try to see what i can do with those cut-ups if not we'll continue to work on that but we've got we did free agency tonight we've got a lot of cool content coming out to you debate my take has been a big sensation among people is that while the views aren't the highest man the people watch it to the end they love the debate show so we'll keep bringing you as much content as as we can um like this stuff so we'll be next i guess we'll have to look at some free agent prospects probably save that a little closer to when you start seeing uh what teams are going to be doing and some things draft combine all on the horizon cody um what do you want to plug and tell them how they can find our work yeah, man, you can find uh, one, find me on Twitter at Cody Lax, C-O-D-Y-L-A-C. You see it right there on screen. Um, you can also find my written work at drafttech.com, where I am the analyst for the Carolina Panthers. I write first round and second round picks, but we don't have a second round pick. Um, and then also, man, keep it glued to this channel. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff with the Friday free-for-all. Every Friday at 7 p.m. where the fans can join the show. We're going to be doing war rooms. We're going to be discussing draft players. We're going to be doing, um, at some point coming up here very soon, film rooms. Like I was doing last year on specific prospects coming through the draft. It's that time of year, man. Hit the notification bell. Keep it glued to the C3 Panthers podcast for um, all your off-season Carolina Panther content. Call in to tomorrow, tomorrow night's show at 
252-228-5098. That's 252-228-5098. You can support the show uh, by don- by donating via Cash App, PayPal, as well as Super Chats and things. But the biggest way you can support the show is just by subscribing, participating in the chat, um, hitting them with thumbs up, and just being part of this community as we lock arms and walk forward trying to figure out how to get through this mess that's been created by David Tepper, number one, Matt Rule, two, uh, and that has been left for us to deal with three. Uh, until that's all I got, Cody. Let's go ahead and get out of here and watch this. Poor, poor Cardinals right now getting stomped. I, I was They're hoping this was going to be my upset of the week in the playoffs. Doesn't look like it's happening at this moment. Yeah, by the way, how about my upset pick? Looking pretty damn good. I picked the 49ers over I the know. Cowboys. It was the closest line, man. And I tell you, uh, I mean, look, the the 49ers are that buzz. That's like a Ron Rivera team. You know what I'm saying? Good defense, run the ball, get ahead. and But they just got a great offensive mind. And Kyle Shanahan, that can make anything. He can make chicken salad out of chicken shit, it looks like. All right, Cody, take us out of here, man. All right, Panther Nation, until tomorrow night at 9 p.m., keep pounding. Early nominating contests build momentum for 2024 contenders seeking the White House. C-SPAN is the place for political campaign enthusiasts, with unfiltered coverage surrounding the early primaries and caucuses, as well as speeches from key battleground states. Whether you're interested in your state's race or want to follow all of the political events, you can get immediate access to what the candidates are saying, plus nominating results in real time with a free mobile app. C-SPAN now or watch live on the C-SPAN networks.